Well, first thing, so thank you very much indeed to uh, Ted CT and to Rebecca for the invitation um, to talk. Um, and I think in all of these things, uh, the whole is uh, generally greater than the sum of its parts. And um, I feel very privileged indeed to be uh, a very small part of a team looking after patients in the Northeast who suffer from thyroid eye disease. In an ideal world, I'd want to sit down with every single one of my patients in clinic, preferably probably over a drink, and have a long discussion about what's been going on with them and how we can help them out. With more complex diseases, you find that it's harder to get information and uh, it's hard to find reliable sources of information and there's more to go through. And so what we often find is that it's very, very easy to be uh, buried under the doom and gloom and all the minutiae and all the complications. But I think having an event, something like this, where we actually can spend a good few hours actually unpacking a lot of the issues, lends a lot of perspective. And also it means that I, I would, it's the same process that I would dearly love to go through with every single one of my patients in clinic when I can't. So um, what I'm gonna do today is uh, just for the next, uh, next half an hour or so, just cover these topics about who I work with, what we do, and um, if you indulge me in a few moments where I could have a few thoughts as well. So um, the first thing to say is that um, all the pictures here are from this um, book. Uh, so Professor Rootman, uh, Vancouver, and um, it, it's required reading for anyone who does orbital surgery, really. So this is what all of the, uh, the pictures and diagrams are from. So I don't work alone, and absolutely far from it. And so when uh, you come and see me in clinic, I'm only one of a small, uh, I'm only a small part of that group. And so obviously we've got the endocrinologists, uh, and we have Professor Pearson Petros with me, and also um, Lucy Clark, who is a consultant as well with me. Uh, and around us, we have amazing, dedicated, uh, experts in their own field who are now allow us to do the job uh, which we otherwise couldn't do without them. So just to take an example, patient, people who check your glasses, optometrists, uh, we've got radiologists who do your CT scans and also report on them. Uh, you've got squint surgeons who straighten eyes and you've got orthoptists who actually see what's going on with the eyes and the positions of the eyes themselves. And increasingly, we're involving uh, some of our ENT colleagues as well, which we'll touch briefly on. And also, we need to speak to some oncologists because they hold the keys to uh, the radiotherapy, which uh, some of you in this room have had. So it is a complex uh, 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 process. And so when you come and see us in clinic, it very rarely is the five minutes that, um, that it may seem to be in the first place, and it can quite often take a whole afternoon, and that's one of the reasons why. So today, I'm not going to show you how we do surgery. So uh, I'm not here to teach you uh, about exactly what we do and why we do, but what I do want you to do is have a much better idea of what's the thinking behind what we do. And these are, this is really kind of the main slide I want you to take away. And these are kind of two concepts that are run in parallel. So the top half is, as it says, treatment and rehabilitation, but the thing is that the two overlap and that's quite important. And then on the bottom is the more traditional kind of thoughts where we um, push the eyes a bit further back into the head, straighten them and then bring the eyelids back into position. But what I want you to think about is that everything should be thought of uh, together. And the thing when I talk about treatment, um, I think it's about something that you're likely going to need. So when we talk about doing surgery on your eyes for thyroid eye disease, it's something, something hasn't gone right. Something is, is in a, you, your sight could be threatened and we need to do something about it. Rehabilitation, you don't have to have it. But th the thing is though, that, that there's sometimes the treatments in both, so the procedures that we do, apply equally to both groups. On the left-hand side, the treatment side, so um, Professor Pierce, uh, Simon went through some of those things that we worry about. So in terms of if the, uh, the tissue inside the socket starts to squash the nerves themselves, it can make you not see quite so well. So very dangerous, sight-threatening problem. And if your eyes are pushed so far out that your eyelids can't close down to over to protect them, then they, they can dry out, you can get ulcers again, it can threaten your sight. 
and the nerves themselves can get a bit longer. Globe subluxation is very dramatic, but very, very rare indeed, where the actual eye itself pops out of its socket. But uh, very, very rare indeed. And then this is the congested orbit. So um, some other places will call that a hydraulic orbit. And what happens is everything is so squished that the pressure inside the eye shoots up. And so when we offer you surgery in this particular group, it's probably, probably it's because it needs doing. Whilst rehabilitation, I think, is just as important, but the emphasis is slightly different. And the idea is to bring you back to how you look before. And Simon did go through this as well, but it's talking about your eyes being bulgy, and the technical term for that is proptosis, when you see two of things, and if your eyelids are higher than they should be, so giving you that particularly starey appearance. So we'll go into the more traditional model first and talk about orbital decompression. So orbital decompression itself is best thought of in this kind of diagram. So if you imagine an ice cream cone full of sand, and this is a, a large ball on the front, and this is an eye which has been pushed forward because of thyroid eye disease. If we were to remove one of those walls and make a kind of an extension, as it were, then it would kind of make sense that the ball would just sink a little bit further back because there's more room. And if you make two of these walls and extend them outward, then you'd expect that ball to fall further back. And that is the basic fundamental principle of orbital decompression surgery, which is to uh, make the volume inside the cone itself smaller. So it means that the eye itself can fall back into a better position. So if we go away from the cartoon, this is an entirely normal eye. If you slice somebody open, and you can see that the eye itself has got a connection at the back which runs to the brain, and that's called the optic nerve, and that's the main cable in your eye, and that's what you see through. And these are essentially reins, which are like, these are the extraocular muscles, and they uh, control movement. And so if you pull on one, the eye turns, say, to the right. If you pull on another, it turns to the left. And these are the muscles which are particularly affected in thyroid eye disease, as well as all of the fat and the uh, fibroblasts in the uh, orbit itself. So this is an abnormal CT scan. So this is effectively the same from left to right, but this is an actual CT scan itself. And you can see here that um, the muscles themselves are a lot larger than they should be. But if I can convince you that the nerve which is coming down here actually is squished by the muscles at the bottom just here. And so if that's the situation, it makes sense for us to try and give more room in this particular area. And the first part of our treatment is what we call medial orbital wall decompression. So the orbit itself is this cone that we described. And this is the medial wall, so the, the nearest to the midline. And this is the lateral wall, which is the furthest from the midline. So we'll try and remove some of this uh, bone just here to allow the material uh, the volume uh, to increase, so very similar to our ice cream cone that we were talking about. And again, this is from uh, Professor Rootman's excellent book. So that nerve goes through into the back, into the brain here. But what we're looking at is trying to remove this particular bone here. And the way we do that, essentially, is to make a cut on the inside of the eyelid just here. And then we reach behind and we remove that bone for you and break that bone. And that's called a medial orbital decompression. So utterly invisible. So once patients have had it, you won't be able to see. Um, and um, it's a, a jolly good way of doing it. And by doing that, you can relieve the pressure on the nerve. And that's very important in situations where it's potentially sight threatening. In other words, it prevents you from going blind. And this is a CT scan, which shows a normal uh, orbit on the right-hand side just here. And then on the left-hand side, you can see that this bone, which was there, has now gone. And you can see that the, the muscle and the fat has actually started to cave in into that side. So that's a successful medial wall decompression. Now, in, there are different ways of doing this as well, not just the way that we do it. 
One of the exciting things that we're doing at Newcastle is actually we're collaborating with our ENT surgeons and uh, they can do this from up the nose, so an endoscopic approach. And we've, we've done this for two of our patients in the last year and it's been very, very successful. Now, we're going to ask the question, why is it that you would choose to have this up the nose as opposed to an open approach? And the main reason why was actually in terms of planning, if it's very, very tight indeed, um, and we don't feel as though that we can safely do that open approach, then someone going up the nose and removing some of that bone, giving us more room and buying us time is a very, very good thing. The trouble is with going up the nose, it means that you can't actually remove anything from the orbit itself. So usually we remove a bit of fat and allow that so it means to, to generate more space. But if you go up the nose, it means that we can actually save sight, but it doesn't do anything for rehabilitation itself. So that is a different approach and uh, we are looking at how we can use that more. So going on to the lateral wall, so this is now the other side, so nearest to the side of your head. And in the lateral wall, you effectively are going to be removing all of this section here. And as you can see, it's not just only one bone. Um, and the idea is that, again, generating volume. There are many, many different ways, and I even know that the orbital surgeons within the room will have different ways of doing it. But in Newcastle, we favour the transconjunctival approach, which is also called a swinging eyelid approach. So the reason why we do that is because it gives a very, very nice cosmetic result with no scars over the top of the uh, face itself. Uh, and also, uh, we also probably think that there's one rare complication called uh, masticatory oscillopsia. So the idea is, is that if you chew, that it makes the eyelid bounce up and down is a lot less with this approach as well. But the key is not the actual approach. The key is how, works, how well it works with the individual surgeon. So once we do that and we've opened up the eye, uh, it looks pretty much like that. So you can see that this is a basically a power drill and this is the eye itself, or the edge of the eye. And what we're doing here is to make more space. So we're drilling away the bone here and it means that the fat, which was otherwise inside surrounding your eye, has now got extra space to move out. So again, going back to that ice cream cone principle that we were talking about, about generating extra space. So just to allay any fears, this is done under general anaesthetic. Oh, it takes about an hour and a half or so. Recovery time, rather good. And a rather good operation. And once this has been done, you can see that here there's a gap and that's where that lateral wall, so that side wall, has gone and this particular patient has had both of her lateral walls done. So you can also do the floor as well, uh, it is possible. Uh, we don't do as many floors uh, as we used to, uh, but uh, the main um, mainstay of our decompressions are either going to be one wall, the medial or lateral, or both at the same time, which we can sometimes uh, is known as a balanced decompression. If all of that is very successful, what we sometimes have to uh, think about is strabismus surgery. So if we take one step back, if we imagine that the eyes have now back into position and they're not quite as taut as they used to be, it is possible that one may end up looking that way and one may end up looking the other way, and that's double vision. Clearly that's not satisfactory. And so at this point, it can be either corrected by using prisms, so specific uh, glass, which means that it brings the image back into into place. Uh, and it also um, you can have surgery by our squint surgeons to correct that as well. And we're very lucky at uh, Newcastle to have a team who are highly experienced with that. Uh, and I'm not an extraocular muscle surgeon, but uh, uh, these pati uh, our patients who go to them come back uh, with uh, amazingly good results. So once the eyes have been straightened, uh, then we go to the next stage which is eyelid surgery. So even though the eyes have been put further back into the orbit, you still don't reverse the changes which are to do with the eyelids themselves. So if the muscles which are controlling your up and down action of your eyelids from the top and the bottom are effectively scarred, pushing the eyelids, uh, the eyeballs back doesn't automatically correct them. There's a proviso in some, in some cases that actually does happen. 
but not in all cases. And so this is just a summary of some of the most common procedures that we do for that to try and correct that. And so if we were worried about the height of the eyelid being too high, we can first start dealing with the muscle which is on the underside of the eyelid first, and that's called a mullerectomy. If that doesn't quite work, we can deal with weakening the muscles at the front of the eye, and that's called a blepharotomy. And if that doesn't work, we can also put something rigid to try and uh, force the eyelid down just a little bit further. And uh, in our center, we prefer to use um, cartilage from the ear, from the pinna just here, and that works very well. And there's a, uh, this is just a picture of that same process. Uh, but this is on the lower eyelid just there, so you can put a bit of cartilage just there. And the idea is that it brings the eyelids back into a better position. So the, the decompressions themselves, generally um, our patients, there's a, 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 a quite a lot of predictability about that. The eyelids, uh, the squint surgeons are absolutely fantastic. But the eyelid surgery itself is the stage which a lot of our patients uh, find that there is a lot of variability. So there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between cutting or weakening a certain muscle to get you the correct result that you want. And so we've never ever promised that it would all be sorted out in one procedure. And in some uh, cases, it can end up being anything from three to four to five procedures to get that absolutely right. But our promise to you is that we're not going to give up until we get it right to your satisfaction. So having talked about surgery, we can't possibly not talk about complications. And I think it goes to explain how difficult uh, a disease, thyroid eye disease, is to deal with and how complex it is to sort out. And so this is a list of complications which is incredibly scary. But the way that I've divided it is that the top group here are more common the middle group here are not that common, and the bottom are vanishingly rare. And it goes back to what I was saying about the beginning with complex conditions, which is that it's very easy to be discouraged by the minutiae and the complications. But I think it's very, very important to be well advised and also to be uh, true to what the aim is and what the intention is. So when you are removing bone, around the eye, this is for decompression, it's not uncommon after the surgery to have slightly numb cheeks. And what we find is that in 90% of cases that gets better after about three to four months. Double vision, we're not sure about that because we haven't been seeing as much of it of late, um, after, immediately after surgery. But it's something that we would absolutely make sure that you're aware of and the, the main thing we'll tell you is that it is fixable. Now, whenever you remove any bone, it's not surprising that the eye ball itself can sink slightly. And this is a, a more of a concern for patients who, for example, have disease more on one side of the eye, uh, one eye than the other. And if there is a difference between the heights, it is quite noticeable. Um, Simon talked about reactivation of orbitopathy, so it's about 5% or so. Um, after surgery and how that shows is that instead of being up and about straight away um, after about five days or five or six days after surgery it's a much longer recovery and sometimes uh, it, you may require to have some more steroid as well something to, to calm that down. Any pulling or shoving can make the eye the pupil itself a bit bigger because of any kind of effects on the nerves. Infection is very rare and luckily we haven't seen that now, these small ones are really to do more of the surgeon and more technical kind of techniques. So making sure that because we are operating very close to the brain, that we don't actually drill into the brain itself. And that's all to do with good surgical planning and technique. If you pull on any blood vessels, now these blood vessels that we deal with, they actually go into the brain through windows in the holes around the, the eye itself. So that's why we don't pull hard, because if we cause you to have a stroke, that is a big problem. This is masticatory oscillopsia. So there are different places who, for example, would choose to operate from outside in as opposed to inside out. And I think that both of those approaches are good depending on who does them and whether it works for them. 
But uh, we prefer inside out, as I say, because I don't, we, we prefer not to have this complication uh, because that's when the muscle is disrupted. And it means that when you chew, it actually makes your eyeball bounce up and down as well. But again, it is fixable. And then finally, watery eye has to do with if there's any damage of the drainage just here. But I would, what I would say is that the complications themselves are, um, they are rare. But the trouble is if they are present, they can be serious. So, just finally, just a few thoughts from, from my side, is that it is a complex and rare condition, and it, and it only goes to show that it was only until 2009 that the Amsterdam Declaration came out, um, and that wasn't that long ago. And in my clinics, together with um, Simon and Petros and Lucy, every single patient comes with a story. And quite often, you may recognise that there's a bit of anger, a bit of abandonment, inconsistency in the way that they've been treated prior to coming to see us and uh, anxiety and we also understand that it's not uncommon well to have a loss of trust uh, with doctors as well. Simon was quite right to talk about the fact that this condition is very much linked with quality of life and I also agree that one of the good things about the way that Gray's orbitopathy has been graded is to do with quality of life and effect of life and I absolutely, uh, I absolutely agree with that. So it is a complex condition, and also, for, as I am, I am an eye surgeon, it's also useful to add that not every single person who comes into our clinic with a bulgy eye actually has thyroid eye disease. So it's, uh, it's not the only reason why somebody has a bulgy eye. The surgery itself is complex, so I've managed to um, silence the room uh, with that list of complications. But having said that, um, I remember reading a paper about 10 years ago which said that surgery is failure of medical therapy. Well, if that's the case, then I want to be unemployed. And I would be very, very grateful for that because it would mean that something had changed from our medical colleagues to make it possible for our patients not to be subjected to surgery. But until then, you've got us. So there is inequality of access. There are probably some centres which are not as well equipped as Newcastle Eye Centre to be dealing with thyroid eye disease. Um, and um, I think that the disease itself is very variable. So after all of our patients have gone, um, all the, uh, the four consultants will sit down and talk about what's been going on in every clinic. And this is what happens behind the scenes. And there are a good handful of our patients who we ask questions about because we recognise that thyroid eye disease is not the same in every single patient. Why is it that some patients do very well after surgery? Some patients have no effect at all after they've had steroid. Why is it that some patients, if they smoke just a little bit, everything kicks off again? We don't know. But that's, that's even more reason for us to treat every single one of our patients as individuals and that also means the surgery is also individually tailored as well. And I suppose that I see a very skewed view of thyroid eye disease as well. So I was listening to about these comments about our patients going to see their general practitioners and all their endocrinologists and not having had their eyes mentioned to them. And I am very, very sympathetic of that, but I think I probably have a very skewed view because uh, quite often it's the most severe and the patients who are suffering the most to come to see us in clinic. And I don't know what happens and what that conversation was, but what I'd like um, uh, for all of our patients to come with is a sense of cautious optimism. And again, I am very proud of what we do at Newcastle, and um, I, I hope that we can carry on handing those skills out and have more of these sessions where we can just sit down and talk about the disease itself. So this is just a final slide really from me about the surgery that we offer. So we talked about orbital decompression, strabismus surgery and eyelid surgery. But some patients may end up just having an orbital decompression and that's it, and we wave goodbye as friends. Some patients may do a decompression, not need any eyelid straightening and just need a, a little, um, their eyelids uh, set into a better position. And some patients don't need any orbital decompression at all. So it's completely varied or you may absolutely need Nothing at all. So thank you very much indeed for coming. 
And what I would say is that in the same way that we approach our surgery um, with cautious optimism, I just want to encourage you that there is an end point in this condition, like some other conditions, and that we want to be part of your journey. Thanks very much.